All right, let's stand together for the reading of God's Word. Open your Bible to the Gospel of Luke and find chapter 11. We're going to continue in our series and uh, look forward to what the Lord has to say to us tonight about spiritual warfare, about doing battle with the devil. The Gospel of Luke, and we're looking at chapter number 11. And uh, we're going to pick it up at verse 14. We're going to read through verse 26. The Bible says in uh, Luke chapter 11, verse 14, And he was casting out a devil, and it was dumb. And it came to pass, when the devil was gone out, the dumb spake, and the people wondered. But some of them said, He casteth out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils. And others, tempting him, sought of him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against the house falleth. If Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Because ye say that I cast out devils through Beelzebub. And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore shall they be your judges. But if I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in, are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him, and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor, wherein he trusted, and divideth his spoils. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad, or scattereth. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest. And finding none, he saith, I will return unto my house whence I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in, and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Father, help me to begin now this set of messages on the important issue of applying what we learn from you about prayer to the work of spiritual warfare. Help me to be clear, plain, so that your heart will be revealed clearly to every heart that's here so that we will think correctly and rightly about this issue. In Jesus' name I pray and ask you for that help. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. You know, let's pray the prayer the disciples prayed. Lord, teach us to pray. That's the spirit of this series. I hope you're asking the Lord for that each time you come to one of these, one of these messages. Lord, teach us to pray. I want to, when I come to church tonight, I want to go away with something that helped me in my prayer life, something that helps me uh, understand praying better, something that arms me to use prayer the way Jesus intended that I should use it. Lord, teach us to pray. And I trust that's your heart. Now, tonight we're going to follow up on what we brought out in the last message, that the essential purpose of prayer, at least in that lesson that Jesus taught on prayer, he brought it to bear upon the importance that we pray for the Holy Spirit. And I hope I don't have to re I'll go back over all of the explanations and caveats and so on, uh, you know, to help people understand that rightly. It is too bad, you know, Satan has succeeded at stirring up so much controversy over some actually pretty simple, basic truths of the Bible that it keeps so many Christians from accessing those truths and receiving those truths. But the fact is, while each of us has as much of the Holy Spirit as anybody else in terms of his sealing for our salvation, it certainly isn't the case that everybody is filled with the Spirit. That's for sure. Not everybody's filled with the Spirit. And some people... Uh, might demonstrate uh, a little bit of the fruit here and there, love, joy, and, but they don't have the rest of it and this kind of thing. And, you know, there's not a full manifestation of Christ in our mortal flesh, as Second Corinthians uh, chapter, I think it's 4, verse 11, calls for. Uh, there are many Christians who live well below the threshold that Jesus set or that uh, the uh, standard that Jesus set, of his expectation that the Spirit of God would flow out of our belly like a river of living water. I think he trickles from most if he moves at all through their life. So we need more of him, and that's the idea. 
And so I think Jesus is making that very clear in his lessons on prayer up to verse 13 in chapter number 11. And then following that, he applies it immediately to this business of exercising ourselves in spiritual warfare. We read the passage. Let me offer a couple of observations on it before we begin developing it. And again, this is an introduction to a set of messages that will be preached on this particular passage. Verses 14 to 26 begins with a story about a man who was possessed of a devil that caused him to be dumb. Now we can get cute here and talk about how dumb devils can make you. But this is talking about the inability to speak. The inability to speak. I'm going to give you a story in a few minutes in the message that illustrates how sometimes a, a dumb devil gets hold of Christians or tries to. But it's true, there are spirits whose impact or whose work is to cause people to be incapable of speech. We'll be looking at that a little bit more in a moment, but that's how this passage begins. This how, that's what sets up or provides context for the lesson that Jesus is going to teach us on the subject of spiritual warfare, on the subject of, de of dealing with devils. So this raised up a controversy. He cast out this dumb devil, and when the dumb devil was out, the dumb spake, an individual who was incapable of speaking suddenly found himself able to speak. And some said, he casteth out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils. And there are always folks like that, you know. If God shows up and does something, they want to right away say, oh, that was just of the devil. If anybody does anything that, um, uh, who is outside of our circle, sometimes we have a tendency to, be, to dismiss it as that must have been of the devil. Now, you've got to be careful here because the devil does do some pretty amazing things. Uh, we know, for example, in Revelation, that the devil is going to do all kinds of wonders. So much so that it would deceive even the elect if it was possible, Jesus warned. So it is true, devils can, you know, do some pretty amazing things and trick people and deceive them. And how to discern whether it's Beelzebub or the Holy Spirit of God requires a very good knowledge, a deep knowledge of the Word of God and a lot of exercise in it, a lot of use of the Scriptures so you can discern, have discerning whether something's good or bad. And that comes from much use of the Bible. And we'll be talking about that in one of the messages in this series. But let's just set it up. Now, there's an occasion here where Jesus Christ encountered a man who was possessed of a devil that afflicted him with muteness. He was unable to speak. Jesus cast that devil out. And some of the Jews around him said, oh, he just did that by the power of the devil. Wow. Wow. Others responded by saying, hey, that was pretty neat. Do another trick. Show us what else you can do. Give us a sign that will prove who you are. Isn't that amazing? He just cast out a devil. And the man was freed and able to speak right in front of their eyes. And they say, okay, now give us a sign to really show us who you are. That's amazing. You know, people who are like that are never satisfied with anything that's given. And Jesus in one crowd just said, you know, an evil and adulterous generation look or seeketh for a sign. Said, but there shall no sign be given it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas, who was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale. And uh, so that's the only sign they're going to get. And of course, he was referring to his own death, burial, and resurrection, where he would be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So there are sign seekers and there are thrill seekers. And there are those who sensationalize all these things, and they're very much attracted to this kind of thing, but they're generally insincere. Jesus took the occasion of this to teach an amazing lesson on spiritual warfare. That's for us. It's really for us more than it was for them. They didn't care. He knew that. They were talking. He was talking to people in the immediate audience that were basically dismissive of his teaching, dismissive of his person, even accusing him of being on the side of the devil. So what Jesus taught about spiritual warfare here was really more for his own disciples and for us, upon whom the ends of the world are come, we might say, than it would be for those unbelieving scorners. As I mentioned earlier, it is sometimes helpful to read through a story like this and take a look at where it's going. 
you get a sense of where the story is going, then you can kind of lock in or zero in on that and then come back through the story again, watching how what Jesus says develops to that place or brings you to that place. So let's do that. In, our, in the case before us, we discover the following first. It is indeed about casting out devils. No question about that. That's the story that sets it up. And the lesson that follows comes to its resolution there in verses 24 to 26, where Jesus, in his application, makes a warning. He says, you know, when a devil, a demon, leaves a house, comes out of a person, the Bible refers to our body as a house, in 2 Corinthians, Uh, Corinthians chapter uh, number one there and it it describes how um, our body is a house and we groan and and look forward to be clothed upon with our house from heaven so the body is referred to as a house and this devil Jesus said would leave a house and go wander about looking for some place to rest and couldn't find any so he decided well I'll go back to the house from whence I came. When he goes back to the house, he finds it empty and he finds it garnished. He finds it all cleaned up, polished up, floors are shiny. All right. And he decides and excuse me. And apparently that bars him from being able to go in. He goes and finds seven other devils more wicked than himself. There's so much insight into the spiritual world in this passage it's really mind-boggling. But right there, you get a lot of insight. There are devils of varying levels of wickedness. There are devils of different kinds of power and different levels of power and different rank. And it's quite an interesting uh, realization that this whole demonic world is real. These devils are individuals. And, and they have some freedom of movement. It isn't the case, in other words, that every single devil has to get instruction from headquarters before he does anything. <laughs> But we'll get into all those interesting details and help you have a greater awareness of the spiritual world as we proceed. This is introductory. That's enough of that for now. So the devil leaves the house. He goes wandering about looking for a place. I guess spirits prefer to have a house. I guess most of us would prefer to have a house. Maybe in the spiritual world, it, it, as uh, analogous to the physical world, um, Bo Weevil's got to have a home. You notice only the older people laughed. The young has just sort of grinned. Remember that old song, oh, Bo Weevil got to have a home? Some of you remember. Some of you are saying, don't sing it, please. I don't, okay. I won't. But so perhaps in the spiritual realm, it is in some way similar to the physical realm. Uh, We need housing. We look for a home. We look for a house. And for a devil, their preferred housing is a body, a human body. That's what they like to inhabit. That's what they like. That's where they like to dwell in a human body. Interesting. So this devil's going out looking for some other house. He's shopping around, you know. Uh, I guess I don't know if they have real estate agents. And okay, we got a little bit playful here. I need to be careful. This is actually a very serious subject. But this devil goes about looking for a house, and he can't find one. So he decides to move back into his old house. He comes back to his old house. It's all cleaned up, and it's garnished. Why he wouldn't just walk in is interesting. Something we develop in the message when we get there. It's interesting. But he goes and gets seven other devils more wicked than himself. And he comes into that house. He storms it, evidently. He overwhelms any resistance that there might have been set up in that house. He overwhelms it. He moves in, unpacks, sets himself up. And the Bible says that that man is in worse shape than he was before. That gives you a lot of insight into the spiritual realm all by itself. That's where this lesson is going. That's the concluding comments to the lesson Jesus teaches us about spiritual warfare. I don't think, however, in this case, that these concluding comments present to us what I would call the major premise of his lesson. The major premise, the main point. The main point. What is the main point or the major premise of this lesson? We need to look more closely 
we notice that he prefaced his conclusion with a statement. His concluding remarks, verses 24 to 26, actually have a little cap on them that's, that kind of segments the whole lesson from the body. Kind of sets it up. It's interesting. And he says this. He says, he that is not with me is against me. So that's the segue. In other words, he's going along in his lesson, developing his thoughts. He comes to that place where he says, he's referring back to the controversy. You guys are saying that I'm working on the side of the devil, but let me tell you something. Fact is, it's the other way around. If you're not with me, you're with the other guy. That's basically what he's saying. If you're not with me, you're with the other guy. And then he warns them. You know, a devil comes out and he gives that whole business. He warns them about the spiritual realm and how they need to be very careful. How devils can come sometimes in leagues and overwhelm and overcome uh, an empty house and occupy it. So that's how it wraps up. And yet still, I don't think we've hit even there the major premise of this lesson. It, uh, it, it certainly does suggest itself as a major premise with regard to his argument with these people who are accusing him of being on the side of the devil, but with regard to the lesson he's trying to teach us, to teach you and to teach me, it seems to me there's another place to look to find the main point, the major premise of his argument or his, his, uh, the thrust of what he's getting at with his response to their criticisms against him. So with regard to the lesson on spiritual warfare taught here, it seems to me the major premise is this, that the kingdom of God has come upon you. That's the main thing he's saying. And you'll see it here in his argument as he develops it, beginning at verse 14 again in the Gospel of Luke. He says in verse number 20, but if I, with the finger of God, cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God is come upon you. you. See, that was the issue here. The kingdom of God had come upon them, and their response was to say, I don't want any part of that. Without using that language, that's basically what they're doing. Jesus Christ manifested the authority of God and the power of God in their midst and they began immediately deflecting it away and didn't want to embrace it. There are many times in our lives, if we're not careful, well, God will move in a powerful way and then we will t have a tendency to deflect, to resist, to dodge, to try to get away from the implication of that truth or of that manifestation of God in our lives. You see it many times. I can give you hundreds of illustrations, and we will pick up a few of them when I develop that particular point more in the series as we move along. I believe the major premise of Christ's lesson to us on spiritual warfare is that the kingdom of God is present. Not, not in the sense of Jesus ruling on David's throne in the physical kingdom as it will be constituted in the millennial reign. But and spiritually speaking, this is a truth. Jesus Christ is king and all men are his subjects. That's a truth. What the devil wants you to believe is that Jesus Christ... He'll, he'll allow you to believe Jesus Christ one day will be king, but you don't. it's all mine now. That's what he wants you to think. But it's not true. When Jesus Christ rose again from the dead, he declared, who, who here knew I was going to quote that verse? Okay. <laughs> all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. All power is given unto me in heaven. I'll get it in earth later. It's not what he said, is it? All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Jesus Christ is king right now. 
He is the ordaining authority behind Romans chapter number 13. All powers ordained of God. Well, who's the ordaining authority? Jesus Christ. How do we know that? He told us that. He said, all powers given unto me. Oh, but that doesn't include Romans 13. No, the word all does. The word all does. It includes that too. The implications are, are very, very interesting and important. So let's roll them out a little ways. We won't go all the way with this right now because that's not the main point of the message. Let's, let's follow some of the implications of that statement. Does that mean that Jesus Christ is Lord of Saudi Arabia? That's exactly what it means. That's why in order for anybody in Saudi Arabia to get saved, it starts right here. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, the Lord Jesus. Interesting in that. Oh, uh, preacher, are you telling me that Jesus Christ is Lord of China? That's exactly what I'm saying. That's right. That's exactly who he is. That's why any Chinese who's ever going to get saved has to start right there. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, the Lord Jesus, that's where it has to start. Every single human being is commanded by the King of heaven and earth to repent. God hath commanded all men everywhere to repent. Where does he get that authority? It's all his. All of it's his authority. All power has been given unto Jesus Christ in heaven and in earth. And under that authority, he has commanded all men to repent. Jesus Christ has commanded every single human being on the planet to, as it were, bow the knee to King Jesus. And they will bow now or they will bow later. As we know, ultimately, every knee shall bow. Every knee will bow. And bow to who? Jesus Christ, to the glory of God the Father. Now, this is something a lot of Christians really don't comprehend. Even many Christians who would, you know, hear something like that and say, yeah, they, they don't, it's almost like the implications of it go to a certain point where they almost back off and say, well, but it's true. Every one of these people that are abusing authority, as illustrated before us daily now with this Kavanaugh thing, every one of these guys abusing your authority, they are directly rebelling against King Jesus. That's what they're doing. They're rebelling against the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And they will be held to account. And he can enter in. He can enter into that whole mess, just like he entered into that dumb man's life. There was a devil attacking a man causing him to be dumb, unable to speak. Jesus Christ showed up in the authority of the kingdom of God. He moved the finger of God. That just took a little finger movement. It didn't take a whole lot, just a little finger. <laughs> and that devil was out of there. And all of a sudden this man starts talking. All the devils that are, that are, in some cases, possessing some of those people over there in Washington, D.C. How many of you agree with me that there are some devils that possess some of these people? They're, they're, some of them are devil-possessed. I, I showed some pictures a little while back on my website. That I mean, it's eerie. Some of the looks, you can see it in their eyes. I mean, it's obvious. They just got a devil, maybe many. There are devils that swarm Washington, D.C. I mean, just... It's infested with, it's thick with demonic activity. The kingdom of God can move into that place and God can move a finger or two and the devils will lose their influence and lose their power, right? However, you've got to have something come in and fill the house. That's the important thing. Now, that gives you a sense of where we're going with this as we develop it. Again, an introductory message. Touching on, the, on some things. You know how I do that. Touch on some things and kind of go over what, where we're going. Then I'll come back and do a message on each one of these major points. The major premise of Jesus' lesson is basically this. The kingdom of God is on property. And what he taught us about prayer is we can pray for that. 
Because the kingdom of God on property is the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, did he not, that he would send the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit would come into the world and reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That's what the Holy Spirit will come into the world to do. I think it would be great to have the Holy Spirit lay down a major reproof upon those wicked, lying people in Washington, D.C., or in Sacramento, or wherever they're holed up, Beijing, wherever. Where's uh, Kim's place? Kim Jong Sung. Well, I know it's Korea, but what's his? Pyongyang Yang or some weird thing. Pyongyang, yeah, of course. Pyongyang, and, and so on. And where I'm going with this is that Jesus Christ had a vision that his spirit would flow through our belly like rivers of living water. He taught us a lesson on prayer that has as its intent to bring us to a place where we can learn how to go before his throne and get the Holy Ghost working in our lives and through our lives. And it's all about God coming into Satan's territory and running him off. There's a lot of Bible about making him go away. Submit yourselves, therefore, unto God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And many other verses like that. We are in a spiritual warfare. There are devils active all around us, in our church, upon some of our members, uh, at, at all over our city, all over our state, all over our nation. There's a great concentration of them in Washington, D.C., It's interesting, this word Beelzebub is a word for fly, king or lord of the flies. That's interesting, isn't it? Lord of the, how many of you read that book, Lord of the Flies? Okay. Well, I mean, that book does have some interesting spiritual insight. You think about human nature, kids left without supervision, those sorts of interesting things. But the truth is, the Lord of the Flies has got his buzzing flies looking for detritus to attract them and land wherever they can get at it and gather there. And what I mean by that is you better stay clean. Now you're going to say, wait a minute. He went to a house and it was all cleaned up and polished and seven of them went in. Yeah, it took seven to get in there. It took seven to get into a clean house. Actually, eight. He got seven more, more wicked than him, and they got together and went in. So there is some value of living a clean life, but the greater value is to live a filled life. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. If the Holy Ghost has moved in, then he who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. And the best way to keep the flies off is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the way you keep the flies off. Otherwise, you can just get crowded with flies. He say, well, a Christian can't be filled with them. I know, but they can sure be covered with them. Yeah, amen. So, we learn much about spiritual warfare through this passage. Just, just go through and, and we'll kind of come to, toward the conclusion right now as I wrap it up. But, it, you know, I know my conclusions sometimes are, well, anyway, never mind. Who cares? But the bottom line is, what we're going to be talking about is how you can break the power and influence of devils in your life. One of the important messages in this set is going to be on the issue of prayer and fasting. We're going to start a revival effort here this coming Sunday with evangelist Paul Abbott. He'll be here Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and then Wednesday. I'd like to challenge somebody here to join us in prayer and fasting. Zach and I are going to do some prayer and fasting together on Saturday. You might want to join us Saturday or pick what day works for you with your schedule. And but prayer and fasting. Jesus said in Matthew 21, uh, with regard to another demon possession case that was brought to him after he cast that devil out, 
because all of the disciples, or at least the nine of them who were there while he went up into the hill to be gloriously transfigured before, you know, Peter, James, and John, and you had Elijah and Moses on either side of Jesus Christ. And curiously, each one of these personalities noteworthy for having fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Moses twice. Which does not mean he was twice as powerful as Jesus and Elijah. How long you fast isn't some criteria by which you don't get certain power points for each day you fast. Moses had 80, Jesus had 40. It doesn't work that way. So one, you know, myth to dismiss from your mind right now, you don't gain any special advantage because you fast a certain amount of time. Isaiah 58 is a chapter you ought to read if you're going to do some fasting anytime this week as we come into our revival time or if you plan to do any fasting at all uh, down the road. If there are any areas of your life where your spiritual life has gotten blocked, you just seem to have, uh, the enemy has seemed to succeed at blocking you from going farther, from overcoming some area of your life where you, you're just bogged down and you're tied up and you're in bondage. Or a loved one. The Bible teaches that certain kinds of devils can only be dislodged. Certain kinds of devils can only be overcome. There are some devils more wicked than others. There are some devils stronger than others. And there are some devils that you cannot overcome except by prayer and fasting. This kind cometh not out but by prayer and fasting. I believe there are those kinds of devils operating in our city. I believe, do you agree with me? I certainly believe there are those kinds of devils operating in Washington, D.C., no question about that. It's, it's going to take something more than your run-of-the-mill, you know, a business-as-usual kind of spiritual fervor and, and, uh, and discipline and dedication to overcome the oppression we are under as a nation and the oppression we're under really in this state. It will not be done until Christians get so burdened and broken they are willing to let their laughter be turned to mourning for a season. They're willing to do what we've been exhorted to do, and it's to set ourselves apart for a season of serious prayer and fasting. So I call on the church to pick a meal. If you don't do a lot of fasting, if you have health issues, I understand all that. I always get those questions when I preach a message like this, but I have this disease, that. I get it. I understand that. Some of you should talk to your doctor and say, you know, I, I believe in the spiritual value of fasting. I would like to do that. Do you have any advice for me? And he might say, yeah, well, and give you some, some advice. Some doctors don't understand it. They look at you like you came from Mars. Why would anybody not want to eat? They just do not, you know, it does not compute. Their arms start wobbling around and doing weird stuff. So, you know, you might have to ask a different doctor. You can go online. There is some good information there. My little book gives you some tips in the back of it, Kingdom Power by Prayer and Fasting, in the back of the last chapter, it gives you some tips on fasting, what to expect, what to look for, and all this kind of stuff. So do some research if you have some physical issues you're concerned about. But I, I don't know of any physical issue anybody's concerned about that would disqualify them from fasting at all because you can fast in other ways as well. I think the best way to fast is put aside food and water. Be careful about water, obviously. Uh, that is a little your body can live quite a long time without food surprisingly but without water it's a little bit of a different story i've gone as many as seven days without food and water and learned and then my uh, you know i thought that the holy spirit this is interesting by the way when you fast extended fasts you need to be very tuned into the holy spirit of god if you do it with pride you know if, i don't think anybody here would do that but i got to put this out there if you go into a fast for some vain reason, like I'm going to, boy, I'm going to fast for 40 days or I'm going to do this and I'm going to make myself some kind of a spiritual thing or something. You need to read Isaiah 58, get humble, get right with God. And maybe you do need to fast in order to break the, the, the devil that's motivating you with pride <laughs> because that is not going to work. I guarantee you right now, that's not what this is about at all. I mentioned you don't get brownie points for how many days you fast. Again, Moses fasted 80, Jesus 40. That didn't make Moses better than Jesus. It has nothing to do with that at all. On the other hand, if you're going to go into an extended fast, then you need to be much more aware and careful about your health, about other issues. Make sure you have somebody watching you, somebody who's there. 
Uh, you don't go hide yourself off in the mountain somewhere we, we may never see you again. You know, if you're going to do an extended fast like that, be around people that love you, that know what you're doing, and they're there to tend to you. Um, another thing to keep in mind is to obviously be very, very tuned into the Holy Spirit. Well, here's what happened to me. I didn't know that uh, you could die if you don't have water for seven days. I didn't know that. Obviously, Moses and Elijah and Jesus did all right. Right? I mean, you know, clearly there are exceptions. But I think they are definitely exceptional. And I had gone without water or food. I was in my, in my seventh day. And the Holy Spirit of God, pro, pro, I thought, provoked me to have some water. Now, I, I've done a lot of fasting, so I know what it is to have the body start rebelling. And, of course, the truth is, after about two or three days, your stomach goes to sleep. Hunger pain really is no longer a problem after that. I, I can't get too much deeper into it. It's just because it's not the kind of stuff that's germane to my message point. So, but, but do be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit prompted me to drink water. I told Mrs. Scheidbach, I said, I think the Lord wants me to have some water. Well, she was on that. <laughs> I mean, I, I, know I didn't even get turned around and back to my seat before there was a knock on the door with water because she wanted me to have some water. So I took it. I put it on my uh, little stand there, and I continued praying and, and uh, you know, just going through my prayer time. That's what you want to use your fasting time for, especially an extended fast where you're too weak. You should be too weak to really work or do anything else. You're just completely set apart to do nothing but pray and commune with God. So I had my Bible open. I'm communing with God and praying. A thought came to me again. A thought came to me again. And, and I, I just said, well, Lord, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to take some water, but I don't want to do that unless it's what you want me to do. I don't want to submit to the flesh in any little bit. I, I want that stinker under control. I want that stinker subdued. I want to buffet this body and bring it under, as Paul did, I, and so on. And so, uh, once again, another confirmation and another. And so and finally, I came to the realization, you know what, Lord, you're telling me to drink some water. I'm going to drink some water. So I began, and by the way, if you have an extended fast, you don't just start guzzling water. Your throat will be so dry and be kind of closed up anyway, you probably choke, so don't do that. Just sip, let it moisten, sip, let it moisten. So I began sipping water for probably the rest of that night, and then the next day uh, began taking water and then fasted seven more days before I broke my fast. And then when you break a fast that's extended like that, you need to be careful about sitting down and gorging yourself. You know, because what it's really weird how this happens. For some reason, I don't know why it is, but if I've been on an extended fast and I and I want to come out of it, all of a sudden I get real hungry. It's like my stomach was asleep for a while, but it was like boom! All of a sudden, it's like man, you get real hungry, and you got to be careful that you don't overdo it. And by the way, not everybody is the same. That's another thing. And by the way, not every fasting experience is the same. It isn't always the same. There are reasons I don't want to go into. Bottom line is. If you're going to fast, be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. I don't recommend you stay without water more than seven days. About a month or two later, I was with Dr. Beckham preaching somewhere. I forget where. He said that he had come across some information that says the human body will die if you haven't had water for seven days. Some people would die after three. Well, that caught my attention for reasons you can now understand. And so when I got back to my room that night, I got busy on the internet, and I did some research, and sure enough, I found a lot of documentation supporting the fact that, you know, at seven days, that's like the limit. You, you got to watch out. You go into a serious dehydration from which you might not recover. So, interesting to me that the Holy Spirit prompted me to take some water at that time in the fast. All of that is to say, when you're doing this, you're doing it spiritually, you're doing it with the Lord, and you're not doing it to bring any glory to yourself. You're doing it in order that, the, that the, the flesh will be brought under. If you deprive the belly of food, you send a message to the soul that the body is not your God. The belly is not your God. The Bible says lusts of the flesh war against the soul. David said, I humbled my soul through fasting. The relationship between the soul and the belly is very interesting. You see it all over the Bible. The Bible talks about how the soul eats and enjoys food. It's interesting. There's a very close relationship between the soul and the belly. The Bible says that by fasting, it humbles the soul. 
Why is that? It's because of the close association of the belly to the soul. Our soul engages and interacts and connects with the world around us physically through our belly, if you will. Whereas our soul interacts and communes with God through our heart. If you're centered in your belly, then your soul will suffer in its relationship with spiritual things. So by chastening your soul through fasting, you humble the soul, and the soul then is able more easily to let go of the fleshly things and not take hold of it so much. So fleshly appetites lose their power over the soul through fasting. And that's what fasting's for. It's the point of it, to bring that body to a place where it lets go, if you will, where its appetites do not govern, where what it wants does not rule. And then finally, something I've been talking about uh, it, it is very important to understand is fasting is not something you do in order to gain influence over God. Amen? You do not fast in order to gain influence over God. You fast to gain influence over your own flesh and the devil. That's why you fast. Okay? Fasting doesn't give you so many body points with God. You get a certain number of days and you say, okay, pay up. It does not work that way. But fasting most certainly, if it's sincere and you do it right, Isaiah 58 gives you instruction about fasting you need to pay attention to. If you do it correctly, then fasting will free you from the control of physical appetites and allow you to much more easily and readily and fully surrender yourself to the influence and control of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen? And when you're in that way, now you have this power. All right? To command devils to leave you alone and get out of your house and whatever else is going on. Let's stand together, please. So hopefully, you're interested. We'll be going through this series. It takes about five messages to go through it, maybe four. We'll start after the revival, and we'll be teaching this on Wednesday nights. And uh, I know you've heard me talk a lot about these sorts of things, but I do have additional stuff to shovel out to you from the feed barn. Amen? We've got big shovel in there. And we're going to be putting that out there for you. All right. Let's respond to God. Do you want this power? Well, start asking him for it. That's what he taught us in the, in the lesson on prayer. You got to ask for it. You ask for it. The Father's ready to give it to you. Ask for it. So pray. Respond to God.